Can I see that just for a minute? I, I, won't, I, I just want to know which side. Uh, yeah, okay, sure good. Going. All right, this is an interview at the Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society, Buffalo, New York. It is the 15th of May, 2007, approximately 1.30 p.m. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Uh, my full name is Joseph Diamond, D-I-A-M-O-N-D. Where and when you were born? Okay. I was born February 1, 1929. Born in Czechoslovakia. C D C H. Yeah. yeah, it's high. It's now the Czech Republic. Yes, yes. Czechoslovakia. Yeah. At the time, at the mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. Because they keep countries keep changing. Mm -hmm. Europe. Mm -hmm. Now, um, where did you live in a rural area or did you live in, in a city? I lived in a, a small town. Mm -hmm. Population approximately 1,600. Do you want me to say the name? Yes. Yeah. The name is S E R E D N E. It's located in the Carpathian region. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not the mainland Czech. Right. Republic. At one time, it was all Austro-Hungary, but uh, through the League of Nations in the 20s, it became Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. so there's there's wars there every two weeks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, what was it like growing up there at the time? Well, it was a great life. I mean, even though uh, everything was primitive, I mean, we didn't have sewers, we didn't have a run, we had didn't have running water, but people were happy. The town was located in a valley, surrounded by vineyards, and every time I talk about it, I get a little homesick. Mm -hmm. And we had all sorts of people. We had all kinds of religion. We had Roman Catholic, Church of England, Greek Catholic. And people got along uh, harmoniously. You want me to continue? Sure. Yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, people got along harmoniously. There was some racism, discrimination, but nothing serious. Mm -hmm. you know? The racism had to do with religion because um, there was some Jews, and because you know, people believe in Jesus Christ, and some people believe in the Almighty. So mm -hmm. there's always little mm -hmm. situations, but nothing serious. There were rumors that we may have World War II. We're speaking in the years of 1936-37. There were rumors we may encounter World War II. Nobody got excited. Like I said, they have wars in Europe every two weeks. The fellow by the name of Hitler was always on the radio. He was, uh, he was yelling his lungs out. He wasn't talking, he was yelling. Mm -hmm. Some people didn't take him seriously, but some people did listen to him. And, some of them even like their ideas. Now, the population in my town, they were mostly Slovaks, you know, Slovaks, Hungarian, mm -hmm. it all goes back to Austro-Hungary, you know. So everybody spoke Hungarian too, that was especially the older people. Uh, well, you couldn't help but World War II did get started. And they started occupying Czechoslovakia, we were occupied by Hungary. Hungary was a German ally. So they wanted to get back that territory, they say, it belongs to them. But the Hungary followed the same policy, as, because since they were a German ally, they followed the German policy. So the minute they entered, discrimination, or discrimination and racism were legal. If you were Jewish or Jewish ethnicity, you were forced to wear a yellow star, so sort of Caucasians. So you could be recognized and you could be humiliated possibly. If you were going to church, an elderly gentleman with a prayer book, he could, have, he could have been beaten up on the road and the police just ignored it. And all the man did is when he was on the ground, they kicked his face in and then he, he rose up and he just looked up to the Lord. We had a lot of religious people. It's just some of the small things. Mm -hmm. Now what kind of work did your father do? What, okay, we, uh, we owned the vineyard, you know, like it's all wine country, mm -hmm. so um, we owned uh, some farms and we also had a small store, like a clothing shoe store. So that's where, what he did. And uh, so we did farming, you can call it uh, farming and also owned the uh, haberdashery or whatever they call it. Okay. 
Um, you want to ask? Okay. Good. What happened when the the Hungarians? Okay. What? So the, the law, these laws began. You know mm -hmm. these what they call the uh, laws against the Jews. Mm -hmm. That's what they call them. Uh, the next laws were we couldn't walk on a sidewalk. They felt uh, it's a luxury because they felt you're not a hundred percent citizens. Even you live there for generations, all of a sudden we're not even hundred percent citizens. Uh, we, there was a curfew, we had to be indoors by 6 o'clock. Uh, you couldn't go to a local, you couldn't go to a local school anymore. So they had problems, the kids didn't get an education. And you couldn't hold a government job. But everybody was still happy because it looks like we were hoping the war won't last long and everything's going to get back to normal. You want me to continue? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to skip now three years. It was already 1944. So, all during that period, we heard stories people are getting killed in Poland and, and uh, Denmark, but you don't really pay attention to it until things happen to you, you know what I mean? Now, did this ever, did this affect your father's business? Yes, absolutely. He couldn't own the business anymore. He had to work at it, but he'd only get 30% of the profits. He had to break in somebody local to take over the business. Okay? Mm -hmm. And and you you were lucky if you were going to get 30% of it. That, that was the law. Also, in the vineyards, when we worked the vineyards, we made, a, we made the wine. There was some Hungarian colonel that he was going to get 80% of the profits of the vineyards, and we did the work. Didn't make sense. But, uh, so all these little skirmishes were happening. It looks like Germany is losing the war. It was in 1944. So we were hoping maybe they'll forget about us. You know, they got enough problems. The sit German cities are being bombed, like the city of uh, um, right now. I forgot the name of it now. Like 600 Allied planes were just bombing a large city in Germany. Uh, the population was in bad shape. Lost, they lost a lot of people. Oh yeah, the city of Dresden, they call it. Mm -hmm. the city of Dresden. So I remember the troops that came into our city, to our village, when they occupied it. They looked like real heroes, you know, like like Roman heroes. They had all the latest equipment. Now they were coming back from Russia, the same soldiers. Mm -hmm. They didn't look so good. Their faces were drawn in. They came back by horse and buggy instead of coming back by trucks. Looks like Germany has had it. So like I said before, we're hoping they got enough problems, they'll forget about us. Well, guess what? They didn't forget about us, about the Jews. It seems they had to, they had to solve the final solution. That's what they called it. So, and it almost gave me the impression that they were more, they were more interested in killing us than winning the war. So, it was already March 22, 1944. Notices were in the paper. And also, they had a guy that was like, a lot of people were illiterate, so they had a, a, guy, a drummer that he was in the center of town and he drummed. People assembled and he told them the news. The following was the news. All Jews in town or Jewish ethnicity will have to be packed within 24 hours and they're going to be taken away someplace to Germany, help with the highways because we're a security risk. It kind of really affected you badly. You live there all for generations, all of a sudden they tell you to leave and you can only take 35 pounds with you, whatever you can carry. I was about 15 years old at the time. My bro I had a little brother that was seven years old. My mom was 39, and my dad was 44. Uh, there's a reason I'm telling you these things. We were all under shock, and we were all packed. There wasn't much to pack. What can you take for 35 pounds? You know, like blankets and mm -hmm. soap and maybe a couple of canned goods. They didn't have much canned goods in those days. Next day, we were all ready for it. We were packed. We, 
Our, the orders were that we're supposed to wait till the soldiers come in and they're going to take us to a local school for processing before we're taken away to our final destination. So next day, two stormtroopers came to our house. They looked like they just came back from combat. <laughs> they had steel helmets on, fixed bayonets. Kind of scary looking for me, especially my younger brother. They told us that we are prisoners now and we're going to be taking the local school for processing before we're taken away. So they told us to, they're going to take us outside and we're going to be waiting on the street because they have to bring more people there. So next door neighbors, they were taken just like us, they were Jews. So they assembled about 600 people on Main Street. They had their, everybody had their luggage or their silly looking luggage and you saw everybody with a yellow star. And we started walking towards the school. It was about two and a half miles. And some of our neighbors were watching us. They didn't look upset. Some of them acted like it's the 4th of July. One man yelled out, Hey, leave me your winter coat. <laughs> you, will you believe that? I thought if I ever survive, I may want to talk to him or who knows what. You know, uh, just something you don't forget, you know. Anyway, that's minor. So, we finally arrived at the school. They checked us out, make sure we don't take any valuables out of the country, you know, the usual processing. And by midnight, we were on a train taken to a larger city. They took people from all the small towns and they congregated them in a bigger area. They took us to a brick factory. The reason to a brick factory is all kind of space, you know. There was no sanitary facilities there. You were sleeping outside. And they told us we're only going to be here four weeks because wherever our final destination is, it's very busy. So somehow or other we managed to suffer through the four weeks, you know. Three, four days ago you had a, a home. You had a heating system. You had a normal life here. You have nothing. <laughs> And who knows? But during this whole time, up yeah. until 1944, were there ever any bombings locally? Uh, not, not, the not, not the, uh, no, not serious. <clears throat> there was some, there mm -hmm. some minor bombings that planes used to fly by. In fact, mm -hmm. some American planes were going bombing the oil fields in Romania, and they went yes. right through that area. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there was nothing important here. Mm -hmm. Bomb. Okay. But there was, you know, but mm -hmm. nothing serious, you know, I mean, things were practically normal, you know, I mean, it's unbelievable. Was there any <coughs> underground activity or partisan groups? Not, the, not at the time, mm -hmm. not, not in my, I didn't know about it, you know, the, you got to remember I was still young yeah, too, sure. but there were partisan groups, not in our area, you know, I mean, things are very much normal, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say we were excited that, and I think a lot of it had to do because Hungary was, kind of uh, procrastinating. They didn't want to, you know what I mean? To, they didn't want to send the Jews out there for hope. It looks like the war is ending. But what happened is they sent a guy by the name of uh, Eichmann. <laughs> you know, they sent him in the area because things were kind of slow. And they put a little more rigid Hungarian government, you know, a little more, um, uh, they call him, uh, how can I say, you know, a little, a little more fashion, uh, national, socialist national government, you know, which is a little more like the Nazis. I mean, they had more of a, a democratic government, now became a little, they were a little more uh, taking after Hitler's policy, okay? Uh, where was I anyway? You were talking about uh, being put on the train. Yeah, putting on the train. Okay, so now we were in that brick factory, you know, in a town called Uzgorod, which is a larger city than ours. You know, it was like, uh, let's take, we take people from Erie, Niagara County, and we bring them all in, to Albany, you know, mm -hmm. to a major area. That was their plan. Mm -hmm. So somehow or other, we managed to live through the few weeks in that break. What kind of foods did you have at this time? Well, yeah, you? well, uh, not too much, you know, they had like, they gave coffee, which was like black water, and some moldy bread in the morning, you know, real old bread, so you couldn't touch it, you know. Lunchtime, you, you had a soup, uh, a little bit like water, with a slice of bread, and at night you had a piece of horse salami. It's, you know, 
when you had a, when you had good food at home, you know, it's kind of tough to, but you could tolerate a little because you were still in good shape. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. At least the families were together. But the time came now to take us away, so they made a, a PA uh, announcement that the trucks are here to take us to our final to the railroad station. These trucks, the trucks are going to take us to our railroad station. Uh, these trucks, when they arrived, they looked like coal trucks. You know, no, no way with a human being can get on it. And they expected senior citizens, little babies. How are they going to get on the trucks? Some little lady was struggling to get on the truck. The soldiers were, I'm just telling you something, they were, their arms folded. They thought it was fun. They picked her up, threw her in there like a piece of garbage. Kids were crying. They lost their parents in the confusion. The soldiers didn't like that. Started hitting them around, and some of them they use their rifle butts. I mean, I was wondering if they had their own kids, you know. Anyway, picked up a little baby, four or five years old, threw him in the truck. These are little incidents that I can't forget. Anyway, we finally got on the truck. It was an open truck, it was cold outside, it was still March, and it was about two and a half hour journey, you know, with the trucks to the railroad station. We arrived at the railroad station. The railroad stations were very popular during World War II. A lot of activity was going on. We noticed a lot of locomotives, uh, war equipment, you know, they, they must have been going to the front lines. We also noticed a lot of boxcars, at least 40 of them all lined up, like cattle cars with little openings for air. So most people thought they're shipping cattle maybe to the front lines, but it didn't take long to find out that's going to be our transportation. They look kind of crude, little opening for air. If you had to put people in there, it could fit 30 people standing. They squeezed 110 of us in there. Okay? They, were, they gave us a bucket of water. We we'll squeezed them like sardines. The train next to us, behind us, had the same thing, at least 110 people. So picture 40 trains with a locomotive in the front started moving. It was going very slow because of the weight. It was going 27, 28 miles per hour. And that was bad for us because we had a complete crisis inside. You know, there was no air, <coughs> exhaustion, there was no sanitary facilities, expectant mothers were getting sick. Within six hours, we had a couple of dead children. By midnight, after traveling a whole day and a whole night, the train arrived in Krakow, Poland. Remember I said they'd taken us to Germany? Mm -hmm. Here we were in Krakow, Poland. All you could hear is people yell for water. I'll never forget, oh yeah, oh, yeah. another reason is they, they kind of kicked out the dead children. They just kicked them right out. I suppose that somebody will pick them up, and the mothers jumped right after their kids, you know. All you could hear is people yell for water, and I'll never forget, since this crack I was Poland, there must have been a Polish lady approached the train with two buckets of water. And there was a human being, you know, that had a heart. Now, two buckets of water wouldn't do much, but it just showed there's, there's a real person, you know. Mm -hmm. As she got close to the train, Right, there was a stormtrooper, he kicked it right out of her hands. He says, get out of here, those people don't need no water, they had enough water. Difference between two people. Anyway, nothing important, but something always goes through my mind. Anyway, we traveled, train continued the journey. Within two and a half, within three hours, we arrived at our destination. We had no idea where we were. It was early in the morning, probably six. There was, we didn't know where we were because we, there's no windows or anything, you know, just a little air. And finally, somebody jarred the doors open and we faced a huge sign in front of us, Welcome to Auschwitz. It said Auschwitz II. Well, we had no idea at the time. We never heard of Auschwitz in our lives. Auschwitz is really Poland. It's called Oswiecim in Poland, where Germany, Germany occupied it. On the bottom of the sign it said in German, Arbeit macht frei. That's a German famous expression. Her work will make you free. To me, it was a joke. How is this going to make you free here? We're going to be slave labor. They told us we faced uh, about three or four German soldiers. They were 
dressed just like we see them in the uh, history channels, you know, with the boots and sticks, and they started yelling, rouse, move, move, we were behind schedules, started beating people, pushing. Uh, one of, some of the prisoners that did some service work, they've been there for a while, one of the German soldiers asked him, what's taken so long to get these idiots out? He said, sir, some lady just gave birth to a child who tried to protect us. This guy picked up the little baby and kicked it out like a football. He says, I have no time for that business. Well, start moving. I got a picture of that man. I wish I, you know, I, anyway. How did you end up with a picture of him? Pardon me? You well, we have a picture of the official photographer of Auschwitz that was in the hospital and he gave, he gave up that album. Mm -hmm. And there's a picture of this man, of this three German soldiers when, the, when they were waiting for the trains. I can produce that picture, you know, I have that picture. But it doesn't matter, uh, it's not going to change. So to continue my story, they told us to get up, start moving out because we're going to be interviewed. They told us to line up with families because way up front there are three German officers who are going to speak to each one of us. They're going to decide what kind of work each individual can do because we have children, elderly women. Uh, so it makes sense. And they also are going to decide, they didn't tell us that, who's going to live and who's going to die. There must be some gods. So here we are in line following a queue. This is my mom, my brother, myself, my dad, inching our way for hours to, to where we get to the interview. It took about six and a half hours and finally we faced three German soldiers, one officer and two German soldiers. Very polite, he said to my mom, good morning. How old is your son, the younger one? She says, I'm, uh, he's uh, seven years old. He says, okay. Now you and the boy, he says, we're going to send to a residential camp. And me and my dad are going to go to a labor camp. And we'll be able to visit them on weekends. Sounds sensible, right? We hardly had a chance to look at him, forget about say goodbye. They threw him in trucks with another bunch of people. When I say threw him, they just picked him up and threw him in there. And that's the last time I saw my mom. My mom and my brother never saw him again. Never saw him again. I didn't know where they went. Right after staying in Auschwitz for a week, I found out. They went directly to the gas chamber. And so did 60% of our train. Senior citizens, Religious people, they didn't want religious people, they were a pain in the neck for them, so they killed them. Religious people, women with children, women with children under 12. If, if a woman had a child that was under 12 years old, the mother automatically got killed too. So that was the case in my, in my, my, my mother was killed because my brother was seven years old. She could have worked, but her problem was that she had a son. So that, that was their policy. So here they killed these healthy people and because children was a big problem for them because they're not produ producing. So we're here in a killing field, Auschwitz. Trails are, trains are rolling in every two and a half hours, especially in 44. You could kill 1,600 people a day. <coughs> trains are coming in. The selections take place, undesirables go to one to the left, people that can work go to the right. Chimneys start smoking within the hour by three and a half hours. Everything dies down, all you could see is mountains of shoes, mountains of hair. And that was happening every day, it was like a killing field. I didn't know it at the time when I arrived, I'm just telling you what, what's happening. But so what happened to me and my dad, they sent us, we, we were taking showers, you know, this, the disinfected area. We take our clothes off, they were going to give us prison clothes. Everybody got a number. Some of us got tattooed. They told us from here on, when you speak to your fellow man, you don't call him by a name, you call him by a number. 
as my father had his clothes off, he kept, uh, you, all of a sudden, you become religious when you're in trouble. So he kept a prayer shawl on him, you know. In our religion, you, it keeps you close to the Lord. One of the prisoners ripped, uh, came off to him, and one of them, he says, you old fool, how could you believe in God? Look what's happening to us. And, you know, where's this God that you're praying and he does all these wonders in the world, you know? Somebody said, maybe he's on vacation. And a lot of us felt that way. They were praying, and we were very religious, they were praying day and night and dawn, and, you know. So, it took us a little, but I'm a believer now, but it took us a while to come back to, to religion, you know what I mean? I just thought I'd mention that, okay. My dad and me were separated. So here we are, I was 15 years old. I don't have my parents, they sent them to a extermination camp, Buchenwald. I found out later. So here I was, 15 years old and completely confused. They put us together between 3,500 guys between the ages of 14 and 17, and a whole group. And they took us into barracks. These barracks looked like stables. We had bunks in there. They looked like they were made out of orange crates. That's going to be our home. Now, you had this prison clothes, this real thin striped, silly looking hat, and wooden shoes. I looked at some of the people from my hometown, the neighbors, multi-millionaires here, they were standing with me with the wooden shoes, scared, you know, it's amazing what's going to happen to a human being. Uh, okay, so, we were, so here we were in that barrack. Some gentleman came out and he introduced himself, a prisoner. He says, I'm a German, he says, I'm a criminal. The reason I was in jail, he killed two wives. Two, he killed two of his wives. He's in charge of us. <laughs> it's real. He says, I'm in charge, he says, and nobody's going to ask any questions, he says. If you people will work and obey orders, everything is fine. If you're not, if you're not going to do it, he says, the gas chamber is 500 yards away. They always kept threatening us with this gas chamber. He says, right now we'll have quarantine because there's some scarlet fever going on, so we have to close up the barrack. Nobody was sick, they just didn't know what to do with us, you know what I mean? While we were under quarantine, I had a chance to take the garbage out, me and another friend of mine. That was a privilege, because at least you'll see what's happening outside. I'll never forget when I got outside, you couldn't see in front of me. It looks like the place was on fire. Smoke, smoking like wild. Uh, and a bad smell. I asked one of the prisoners, the old timers, I said, what's happening here? He said, well, you're here. we have the largest bakeries here, the bacon bread here for German troops, all over the country. I said, nah. you know, why would they need five chimneys, you know, going full blast? There were more people being killed in 44 than all the years put together. It was like the last two around. Uh, I came back, I told the guys we, were, we have the honor to be there, the gas chamber. <laughs> Our location was in a place called, was a camp called B Camp. You know, like there was A, it was like the camps were divided, A, B, C, D. We were in Camp B. On the right of us was a gypsy camp. Gypsies were not a favorite of the Germans. In July the 22nd, 1944, they actually torched the whole camp, men, women, and children. And the only crime they committed, they were gypsies. You know, a lot of people don't even know that. Uh, on the left of us was a woman's camp. We were separated from these ladies by barbed wire, which was electrified. If you touched it, you got electrocuted. It was sad to see these women with their faces, sad-looking faces, and their hair cut off, sure enough and terrible look of prison clothes. Every day when they went to work, the soldiers used to whip them because they didn't move fast enough, you know. It's all right, you can do these things if nobody fights back. Every morning, when 
we got up. We went outside. We could see 25, 30 women hanging from the barbed wire committing suicide. They couldn't handle it. I, I, I recognized my aunt among these women. I threw her a piece of bread. I thought she got it, only God knows. And after that, I never saw her again. She probably got elected to She kept calling me, have you seen my sons? Is, are, are my sons with you, maybe? Because she had two, two sons, they were 13 years old. You know, what, what can I tell them? Now, they put us to work. Our job was to carry masonry materials towards the gas chamber area. Everybody, they build a, a wooden frame, the, the, a wooden frame bag that we carried on our shoulder with straps. So you could put in blocks and mortar in there, and here you were carrying bricks. So 3,500 of us, each one of us carrying this as real cheap slave labor. So it's, it's about two, close to three miles. Instead of taking it by trucks, we're taking it by human <coughs> beings. Now these are all boys. They're boys, the girls. That, that I mean, not all boys. No, boys. boys. Like they didn't mix. You know, mm -hmm. that, that was mm -hmm. separated. Mm -hmm. The women had a tough time. They, mm -hmm. they had a tough time. Some of them came pregnant. They killed their babies because they were afraid both of them were going to get this. Uh, I'll tell you about it in a minute. I'm sorry. Where was I? I forgot already. Uh, about carrying the bricks and more. Yeah, carrying the bricks. So. As we're carrying this brick, we bypassed the railroad station where the trains were rolling in, and I could see people are coming in just like us. I watched a train coming from Paris with women confused, you know, but within an hour the chimney started smoking. It was a production line. It's unbelievable, you know, how they could kill 1,600 people a day. They didn't care about who was in the war. I'll never understand that. So anyway, continue my story of carrying these bricks. After three weeks of the work that we're doing, most of us didn't look so good. Okay? A 15-year-old guy looked like he's 60. Drags his feet as he walks. Her eyes are bulging out, and I look like that too, probably. The guys I went to school with were bunking with me. At night, when you're starving, you'll steal bread from your fellow man to survive. You go right in the station. <coughs> when you're hungry, you see a German soldier on guard duty, you're going to yell out, Sir, can you spare a sandwich? And I'll forget one time one of the guards, you know, they were human, some of them, they threw a sandwich, 20 of us were dying for it. You, it's like survival of the fittest, you know, you forget about your family. You don't want to commit suicide because you're hoping to see that you you know how you what what made me live is hoping to see my family again or or see the face of the enemy when they lose the war, but it wasn't that easy. So that's what's been happening. There's a guy by the name of Dr. Mengele. Did you ever hear of the name? Yes. All right, he was very active in Auschwitz. He decided to have a selection because most of us didn't look they were qualified to work. So it was around mid July. I already forgot the, the dates. They had an assembly in the prison square. And he told us that they need people to go to a bricklaying school. They want to make masons out of us. Isn't that nice? You know? So we were all lined up. He, but he picked the weakest among us. Why would you pick the weakest to go to bricklaying school? He looked me over. I stood on bricks and blocks, so I look a little bigger, and I, so I can show him that I can still work, so I passed. He looked my friend over, he didn't look so good, he made a move to that side. He picked 800 people that day. They weren't going to bricklaying school, they were going to the gas chamber, because they were not able to do the work. They're not going to provide work for people when they came, and they're not strong, they're not going to pay the expense. So 800 were taken that day. They took them to the barracks. They came with trucks and German shepherds. They took them directly to the chamber. It took 20 minutes from in, from out from these barracks to the chamber. You had to take groups to the chamber. You couldn't take individuals. You know what I mean? It didn't pay. 
three and a half weeks later, 1,700 of us were taken away. From 3,500, 320 survived. And I'm one of them. And sometimes I feel guilty. And I was saved by, by one of the German prisoners. Uh, I told you about a criminal. As I was standing in line to go to the chamber, somebody tapped me on the shoulder and he said, don't be upset, I'm going to save you. Never, he never saw me before. He maybe jumps through a window, which was way up, like a high privacy window, like those houses. I jumped outside, I jumped down, and I didn't get hurt badly. And I crawled on my stomach till I got to an outhouse. You know, an outhouse. There was a Russian prisoner of war there, he was in charge. I said, could you help me out? This whole group is going to the gas chamber. I had a chance to get out. Could you hide me? So they can't find me. He told me to get into the hole, right into the manhole. And I was already a halfway up in the sewer. And I was standing on rods. I was holding up rods on two rods. I didn't have a base. And I, he nailed the top down. I was hoping he won't forget to get me out, which he didn't, I wouldn't be here. So this is the way I was, he got me out the next day. I mingled, I mixed with another bunch of prisoners and they kind of forgot about me, you know, got lost in the shuffle and this is the way I was saved from going into the chamber. But the rest of my body were taken. But I'll never understand, a man I never saw before, I started believing in God again, you know, it was like a miracle. Never saw him again, never heard of him before, and that's, that's my story. The Russian army was getting close to Auschwitz now. We could hear artillery fire, we're hoping that we'll be liberated soon. But the killings in the gas chamber stopped now because uh, they didn't want the world to know what's happening, you know, especially the Russians. They didn't want us to be liberated by the Russians, the Germans, because the Russians were angry. They were, they were just as bad as the Germans. They were killing the Germans, throwing them in the river. So, so we were taken by train towards Berlin, towards areas there was no combat. So we, we went by train for about 150 miles, and then a bombing took place. They bombed the train, and we, we had to get out. Then we started walking and, and turned into a death march. We walked through little villages, small towns. Stragglers didn't make it, they were shot. And finally we came to a place called Sachsenhausen, which is near Berlin. Uh, it's an extermination camp. They wouldn't let us in, they said, because it's loaded, it's all filled up. We had to stand outside of the tension under two below zero weather. We continued going through a death march, going through all small German towns in eastern Germany until we finally we came to a place called Liberosa. I'll never forget the welcoming committee in that camp. All um, skeletons laid out at the gate. So I thought this is going to be our end here. But they didn't kill us, they put us to work, we're building Barracks for German retired officers. We didn't do the actual engineering there. We did the dirty work, you know, we carrying sand and sewer and all that. After going through so many death marches and many brushes of death, we wound up in Austria, a little camp near Mount Mauthausen called Gunskirchen. The name is Revo. They brought all the stragglers from that camp and their idea was that they were going to be torched, the whole place was going to be torched before we get liberated, because the war was ending. There was no room to stand in that camp. There was no food. Everybody looked like they've had it. I was about 75 pounds. Some of our guards, the guards that were guarding us, were bored. They started target practicing on prisoners. <laughs> There's a guy who was tied up to a rafter, a blanket, he just took his gun and shot him down. Three soldiers mingled among the prisoners and just started shooting soldiers at random, uh, the prisoners. I don't know what it did for them. You know, they looked normal, like you and me. But the 
It must have been killers to do that. And I'll never understand, because to me, Germany is the most civilized people in the world. You know, people that have given us science, uh, talented people. They were the killers. Uh, but I'm, I can't blame all Germans. I don't hate Germans, you know. I just hate the people that followed Hitler during that period. You know, we got people of German descent in this country, you know, and they're Americans. They, they even fought in World War II in Germany. So, you know, I don't want to give the impression that I, you know, I speak to German students, they come here. And, because once we start hating Germans, we're going to be just like they were. Hitler alone didn't do it. Some people follow them, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, that I'll never understand. But Germany is a different country now. It's a democracy. And they know their mistakes and they're trying to amend, you know. Uh, so I'm in the middle now. So while all this is happening in that camp, you know, prisoners are dying out. War. It was May 5, 1945, and the war was over, and we saw the German soldiers are moving out of the camp. They didn't have a chance to kill us after all. We started moving out of the camp, and the prisoners, so we started moving out too. We walked for about two and a half miles looking for food, and we encountered soldiers, we encountered trucks, tanks are coming towards us. The closer they got, the better they looked. So we were liberated by the American Third Army, Patton's Division. It was an infantry unit. They just happened to run into us. They didn't even know that was there. They couldn't believe what we looked like. They got some of the civilians from, from the village and they <coughs> helped bury the people. They brought a bulldozer, started digging holes, and eight, nine hundred people from a mountain were just pushed right into the ground. It's unbelievable. I've never seen anything like that. Skeletons. The war was over. They took me to a hospital. Um, in fact, a couple of the guys were from New Jersey. I'll never forget them. Uh, the city was Linz. You heard in Austria. I was in a hospital there. I had typhus fever. It didn't look like I wasn't in very good shape. But all the doctors that were there, they all spoke German, so I was under the impression that I'm back in the concentration camp. So I, I run away. I run away from the hospital without a discharge. I walked the street of Linz, Austria. I looked like hell. I didn't look like a normal civilian either. I met up with some Russian soldiers. They were right on the border. They were going towards my hometown, and I asked them if I could bomb a ride. And uh, they gave me a ride. It took about three weeks, and I finally got home. Once I got to my village, I was shocked to see. It looks like things were going backwards. The roads that used to be paved roads are dirt roads. The cattle still go to pasture. You know, there was no progress since we left, and all the stores were closed. People that, I, that saw me thought I was my younger brother. That's how bad I looked. You know, they asked me, how come you're alive? They didn't say, boy, I'm glad you're alive. Can we help you? Now, there were a lot of righteous Gentiles, but I tell you what, they weren't in my own town. Our home was still occupied by civilians. I went up to the authorities. I'd like to get our house back. He says, we can get these people out in five minutes when the Russians are in charge. I says, no. Don't do what they did. Give them 24 hours at least so I can get our home back. So we got our home back. It was very sad. And all the furniture is gone. Bad memories. I didn't know what I was going to do. You're confused. Um, but something good happened. My dad survived. He just walked right in. But he didn't know who I was. He was really in bad shape, you know. Uh, had a little mental problem. And it took a long time for him to come back to normal. I'd say about three months. And uh, he decided that there's no future here. We can't get our property back because under communism, everything belongs to the government now. There's no future here. He told me he's too old to leave. 
It was, only, was, he? It was only 62 years old. Mm-hmm. But in those days, 62 mm-hmm. was like 100 now, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, uh, he says, but I, you know, but I'm still young, you know, and there's a future. And maybe someday, he says, you can contact your re- uh, relatives in, in the United States. He had no address or anything. So I didn't want to leave because I felt, you know, it's only, that, uh, I didn't want to leave. I said, look, there's only two of us survived. Let's stay together. And, but he kept insisting and I, I left. You know, you're still a kid when you're 15 and even though. So I left, I walked the streets of Prague, Czechoslovakia, like a bum. <laughs> some people felt sorry for me. They took me home. They gave me some clothes. I finally got in contact with some refugee organization that was handling people from the, after the war. They were prisoners, and they decided to send me to England. The British government took us out as orphans, you know, to help, and we stayed in Northern Ireland, which is part of Britain, mm-hmm. in a little place called uh, Donaghadi. That was the name of the town. So while I was in, I, I liked it there. While I was in England, I had a chance to, you know, make up some of my education and learn how to speak the language, English language. I also found out I had relatives in Buffalo, but I didn't know their address. Mm-hmm. So we decided to write a letter to the mayor of Buffalo, and they found them. <laughs> like my uncle had a laundry on Jefferson Avenue, it's called Pendrick Laundry. And uh, they uh, asked me who else is alive, and I said, from 90 people, I'm the only one who survived. 90 people were gone. They sent me papers. It took two years, and I finally got here. I, you said that was. Pardon me? What year was that? Okay, I arrived here in 1948, in November the 23rd. I had five dollars in my pocket. That that was money that they mailed and sent me. <laughs> That's all I had. I had an accordion. And when I got off, uh, there was some broken down plane. There was no jet, you know. Uh, the, all the customs were Irish. So one of the guys, guy asked me, how are things in the old side, you know? <laughs> and he says, by the way, he says, I'm, we're going to have to take that accordion because unless you can prove to us you can play it, he says, because you're going to have to pay duty on it. I said, I can play it. He says, well, play some. I want to make sure. So I figured they're all Irish. So I played with an Irish guy that smiling. These guys were crying. <laughs> I'm telling you. So anyway, I, I came, I finally got here to Buffalo and uh, I stayed at my uncle's place, you know, and they tried to help me out, but I had to get moving, you know, there's, I started looking for jobs. I had no education, I couldn't speak too well English. I hitchhiked my way to New York. After, I, after going through so many hitchhike, uh, you know, cars and buses, I stayed at the YMCA in New York City. I started looking for a job. It was tough to get a job because you know, all the GIs were coming. And I finally got a job, uh, you know, in New York, it's all the rag business, everything is clothing. So I got a job in a ladies' garment factory on the production line. I was like, production line of dresses. I, I lasted about a week. They fired me. Meanwhile, the Korean War started and I was at the draft age. I was drafted. I mean, I was, I was 19. I was drafted and I was kind of looking forward, you know, to being in the American Army. I took my basic in Fort Dix, New Jersey. And we were sure going to go to Korea, you know, that, that, those were our orders. But in the last minute, the company commander told us that we have orders to go to Germany instead as occupied, occupation troops. So I was, I was happy to go to Germany. I wanted to get even, you know. But you can't get even and kill innocent people. How long were you in Germany? Two years. I was in a place called Ludwigsburg, which is near Stuttgart. I was an anti-aircraft. Was your father still alive at that yes, time? Yes, but I wasn't in contact with him. Mm-hmm. I was kind of angry at him, mm-hmm. in a way. Uh, I haven't seen him again. He died 
1963. You know. But so so I was in uh, station and like I say uh, in Germany tried to forget my past and I tried to mix with the people. I had no problem, you know. I spoke German. Mm -hmm. And then after that, after I got discharged, I got a job with a company called Bennett Homes in North Tonawanda. They were selling prefabric, pre-cut homes. And um, I was with them for uh, for about six, seven years, and they they went to went into bankruptcy, the company. So I was without a job. So. I decided to go in business for myself. I, I had all the leads from Bennett Homes, and I thought I'd call all these people up and see if I can build their homes. And so I became a home builder, a general contractor. I, I wasn't a big fancy builder, but we made a living. I built homes in Erie, Niagara County, uh, built some in Lancaster, Orchard Park. You know, we built about 10 or 12 homes. So I was doing it for um, for about 35 years, and I developed cancer, colon cancer, and uh, I'm, I'm in remission. So that's my story. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. I, had all, I was I had all kind of illnesses, like brain tumor surgery, you name it. I had it, and I'm still alive. That means that maybe I got to tell the story. Thank you for your... Well, I, I want to ask you a couple of questions. How, how did you feel when uh, Eichmann was captured and, and you mean tried? tried? Well, uh, well, he was one of them, you know. He, uh, mm -hmm. he was proud. He was really proud what he accomplished. He believed in the Fuhrer. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, he was so educated and he, he spoke perfect Hebrew. That guy was a genius. But he says, I'm not killing anything, he says, I'm just in charge of transportation. Mm -hmm. he, he, he took care of, uh, you know, how we're going to arrive to Auschwitz from Hungary, you know, the railroads, that, that was the big deal. Well, I was, I was glad, you know, I was glad that uh, it was done, justice was done the right way, you know what I mean? He wasn't just killed, it was done. Mm -hmm. But there's, a, then they had the Nuremberg trials, and, uh, but you, you're not going to get them all, you know. But at least one thing I'll say to you is, the war is done, the enemy is gone, and there's no after fighting. Here, in the Middle East, we're faced with people that it never ends. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if we ever get out of Iraq, this Al-Qaeda and all these mm -hmm. guys are going to be around, and that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Got to find a solution. Do you, you agree? No, oh, I agree. I agree. Right. I mean, at least we, when you fought World War II with the Japanese, Germany, you finish the enemy and it's gone, right? They're trying to be a democracy, but here you're not dealing with a. You're dealing with some wild people. I mean, Kamasabi, I mean, they kill themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now, you know, we're trying to find four soldiers that are, that they kidnapped, right? Mm -hmm. You see in the paper. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They are already threatening that we better not do that because we're yeah. going to really lose out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to ask the last question. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. No, no, that. that's fine. Uh, yeah. How, how do you feel about the, the historians that claim the Holocaust never existed? Yeah, well, it's a real joke because historians say that. There are yeah. some French. There's a couple of well, French I know, historians Paul, uh, that claim that. Paul Benedict just recently, the anniversary of he, he picked to go to Auschwitz Birkenau, mm -hmm. right there where the killing. He, he yeah. didn't. He didn't pick Auschwitz one. He picked Auschwitz two. It was right there. I listened to him, and, and he made a statement: "Where was God?" I mean, the gas chambers were there. Where are my people? You know, mm -hmm. the gas chambers are still there. All you have to do is call up the German government, ask them if there was a. Just ask mm -hmm. the German consulate. They'll tell you. People are getting a restitution. You think Germany would pay restitution to all these people that there was no, you know? Mm -hmm. So, to me, it's a joke. I don't even mm -hmm. make a issue out of it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just hope I didn't get.
No, 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 it was a nice little interview. interview. Yeah. It, it was sad. You know, it, you know instead of, I, I decided, instead of speaking about World War II, you tell your personal story. Well, that's what we, we want, are the yeah. personal stories. I go to schools. I go to school. I go to mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, Bradford, PA. I speak to colleges and, and everything else. And the students are very interested. I get letters from them. They want to make sure something like this. I said, don't be a bystander in life. Mm -hmm. You see your neighbor mm -hmm. being killed, don't just turn your head. Get involved. And that's the whole thing. Yeah. One other question. What, was your name, what was your no. last name? My name was, uh, you know, a lot of Jewish people have German names. Mm -hmm. that they must have lived in Germany. My name was Diamond Stein. That means in German, Diamond Stone. So I don't know, somebody talked, uh, my uncle told me, he said, why don't you just cut it down? And so now I feel like I'm in the mob. I <laughs> <laughs> got me with that. You got me on that too. I got you. <laughs> well, I'm, I've been watching The Sopranos. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>